Within the last hour, President Putin has been giving a national televised address to the Russian people. Listen. Тема моего выступления события на Украине. И то, почему это так важно для нас. In a rather odd rambling monologue, Mr. Putin insisted once again that Ukraine was a creation of Russia, complaining that it had been madness to allow any former Soviet republics to leave what he called the Soviet Empire. He declared that Ukraine had never had a consistent tradition as an independent nation and blamed the US for supporting radicals. All this after a very bizarre, carefully choreographed televised meeting of his Security Council today, where one by one Putin's subordinates gave their support to recognizing the independence of two breakaway regions. The area in the east of the country has seen very heavy shelling in recent days as tensions escalate and Russian troops remain, of course, stationed at Ukraine's borders. The meeting that you're about to see was the warm-up to the recognition decision which is expected to be announced later. It's Caesar's Palace in Moscow and the boss is preparing to address Russia's Security Council, a distant semicircle of awkward-looking men and one woman. The stage is set for open mic night. Key issue whether to recognize the Eastern Ukrainian separatist republics already under virtual Russian control, a move that would further inflame this crisis. Цель, цель нашего сегодняшнего совещания заключается в том, чтобы послушать коллег и определить наши дальнейшие шаги на этом направлении. If Russians wonder why Ukrainians don't want to live in the Kremlin's orbit, this setup might serve as a hint. It was left to Russia's last president, Dmitry Medvedev, a genuine Putin puppet, to let the cat out of the bag. Эти территории в принципе Украине не нужны. Во всяком случае, это разменная карта в торговле за статус Украины. Жители этих территорий никакой поддержки и помощи от украинских властей уже много лет не получают, наоборот, подвергаются массовым репрессиям. This was a highly staged event at which one advisor after another took to the stage to flesh out Russia's claims and grievances, including his growling foreign minister Sergei Lavrov, here in the role of what passes for good cop. Мы можем констатировать, что есть подвижки, они не существенные, но они есть, и последовательность и принципиальность, которые мы, которые мы проявляем, продвигая наши инициативы от декабря прошлого года, конечно же, встряхнули Соединенных Штатов, Соединенные Штаты и их союзников, заставили взять в проработку многие из ранее отвергавшихся ими российских предложений. Like a cat playing with a mouse, Putin toys with his terrified lieutenants. At one stage telling his foreign intelligence chief, a member of his tight inner circle, say it directly. What really is going on behind those inscrutable pale eyes? While he looks supremely bored, the world is riveted and incredulous. Will this man really trigger war in Europe? And just to get back to that extraordinary address that he gave on Russian television just a few minutes ago, it was a rambling monologue, as I said earlier, but also laced with insults about Ukraine. He said Ukraine was an American colony with a puppet regime run by dark oligarchs. Some might say kettle uh, calling pot black, uh, to be honest. At the same time, he also, you know, remember you saw that bit of my piece where he said to his uh, intelligence chief, be clear, you know, spit it out. What do you really mean? Well, we could say the same to Vladimir Putin, because even though he signaled the fact that he would be recognizing these two republics in the east of Ukraine, he hasn't actually spelt the words out yet. He hasn't done so yet, although apparently he told President Macron and Olaf Scholz of Germany that that is precisely what he would be doing. So, again, the question is, is this a kind of rhetorical build-up to something much more serious, not forgetting there's 190,000 Russian troops based rather like a horseshoe around the borders of Ukraine and, of course, the naval forces in the Black Sea? Or is this just another chapter in this bizarre diplomatic great game? Well, a short time ago, to get some clarity, I spoke to the former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, who also served as the U.S. special representative for Ukraine's negotiations. And I began by asking him how Putin's de facto recognition of independence changes this game.
In terms of the situation on the ground, it really doesn't change anything. They've been occupying these territories uh, for eight years already. Uh, there's nothing new in the Russians being there, controlling the territories, waging a war against Ukraine, etc. What is different is that this now completely undermines the Minsk agreements. Uh, Russia, until now, has been a party to the Minsk agreements, which means that it respects Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, even with respect to Donbas. And this clearly now says that they no longer do that. What happens after this? It doesn't necessarily mean a larger Russian invasion of Ukraine, although I can see the Russians now being invited to put forces, more forces, into the occupied parts of Donbass and staging more provocations as they have been doing for the past few days. Could it in some ways, could this recognition in some ways help the Ukrainian government, even though it's a humiliation for them because they've now effectively lost, you know, genuinely lost a part of their territory, does it allow them to move on? Well, if it allowed them to move on, I think that it would at least give some clarity to the Ukrainian government and its policies. However, I am not at all convinced that by recognizing these territories, Putin is done. He may not launch a major military invasion in the next week or so, but that doesn't mean he has given up putting pressure on Kyiv, trying to change the government, trying to undermine it through all means, including cyber attacks, intelligence, corruption, etc. He certainly has all our attention, doesn't he, in a way that he's never had it before. Yeah, I think he. I think he's really enjoying that as well too. He has Macron calling him. He has Schultz and Macron coming to visit him. He has Biden offering a new summit. Everyone is now, you know, coming to Moscow, and I think he appreciates that a lot. I think that that gives him a sense of power, and he is using that to continue to press demands, and I think expects maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, uh, but he expects people to come, keep coming up with ideas of how to placate him. So obviously the relevance and the limelight are important to him, but he really wants to go down in history as one of the Russian leaders who really helped build or rebuild a Russian empire. I mean, we've been talking about this so much in recent weeks, you almost get used to the kind of, you know, to the vocabulary of this conversation. But if we step back a little bit, we're talking about Europe embarking on a completely new era of almost indefinite insecurity, aren't we? Well, we need to. Putin declared here in Munich 15 years ago that he was embarking on a new security architecture, tearing up the old one, not abiding by existing agreements. Uh, he was rejecting this post-Cold War order. We have been slow to wake up, slow to recognize what Russia has been doing, even after he invaded Georgia, even after he took Crimea and, and started another war in Ukraine. Finally, I think the transatlantic community is going to have to face facts, that we are dealing with an authoritarian and aggressive uh, regime in Russia that has designs on other countries in Europe for as long as Putin is there. And finally and briefly, even if Ukraine is not invaded, you know, as the White House is still predicting in the coming days or weeks, the uncertainty around the future peace in Europe is here to stay, isn't it? It certainly is. Uh, Putin, even if he doesn't invade in the next week or two, will still retain the option to invade later. He'll probably leave a lot of the equipment where it is give the troops some time off and then send them back again later. And he also could be harboring threats against NATO member states, which uh, Europe and the United States would have to respond to, including the Baltic states or Poland. Uh, he has, among his many demands, complained about past NATO enlargement and said that NATO has to remove uh, military forces from those countries, which, of course, will not happen. Kurt Volker, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to say that our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, joins me now here in the city of Kyiv. Lindsay, you heard what uh, Vladimir Putin had to say. You also know about the de facto recognition of these two regions, separatist regions in the east of the country. What is your assessment about how this changes the situation here? Well, what President Putin was, he laid out his world view, didn't he? Ukraine is not a nation. It was created by Lenin. And now they've gone around destroying all those statues of Lenin. How ungrateful they are, not only to the USSR, but ungrateful to the Russian Empire. So I think that that sets the stage for saying, you know, they have no rights. Anyway, he said, the government here in Kiev, it's just a puppet government. They're a stooge of NATO. 
So I think it makes the situation extremely dangerous. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to see tanks rolling down the road from the north to where we are at the moment in Kiev. But we do know that he plans to take those two separatist enclaves, which means presumably sending Russian troops. Maybe they'll be called peacekeepers. Now, how is the West going to respond to that? That's the question. Is there going to be a divided or a united response? Obviously, what he hopes is that the response will be divided. Lindsay Hilsom, thank you very much indeed. Speak to you again soon. Let's go straight to Lesia Vasilenko. She's a member of Ukraine's parliament and joins us also now live from Kyiv. Lesia, we've spoken quite a few times uh, in recent weeks and months, and you've always told me that you thought that the West was being too hyperbolic, too hysterical, too dramatic. I wonder what you make of President Putin's words tonight. Well, uh, you know, it was as if watching uh, a direct, um, you know, shooting from a uh, from a, a crazy asylum, from a madhouse, uh, because the things that Putin was saying, they just do not fit into into the, any real world and into any uh, situation where well, 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 people where they know history at least. So to say that mm. uh, that Ukraine was created by, by Lenin to to uh, cite all of these uh, absolutely made-up historical facts, it was really like watching uh, a crazy man talk and not having the opportunity to say, no, please stop. And I just feel sorry for all mm -hmm. the international reporters and all the politicians who, who had to, uh, to sit through that speech and listen through to him. Of course, he said a lot of these things before, but he's never said them with the presence of 190,000 Russian troops around your borders. So do you feel more threatened, I mean, militarily threatened tonight? I think Ukraine's, uh, Ukrainians and Ukraine feel uh, really threatened and the tension all around. I mean, uh, as we've spoken before, uh, it was present, but uh, in the previous weeks, it was not uh, really crossing the line as to what we have experienced over the eight years. But now when we take everything together, the speech, the troops which are no longer going back but only going forth and which are piling up, and uh, also this uh, uh, completely uh, show trial style Russian Security Council hearing, which was uh, today, uh, where they literally just all appealed to Putin to recognize these so called LNR, DNR, uh, self proclaimed republics in Ukraine. <laughs> all of that uh, together uh, is really creating that sense of insecurity and tension mm. and threat. And uh, it's quite a different situation than even from a week ago. Hmm. Well, let me ask you really bluntly then. Are you preparing yourself and your family for an imminent invasion? You know, it's just today that uh, the news started to really sink in. And uh, it's a tough one. Um, well, uh, I, I can tell you for sure my children are on holiday uh, because it's a school holiday in their school. And uh, they are with their grandmother uh, towards the west of Ukraine, but not so far. It's just 100 kilometers from Kiev. Apart from that, uh, um, myself and my husband, we are staying put in Kiev. Uh, there's no way we're going to, uh, to be moving uh, anywhere anytime soon. I just canceled a couple of uh, international engagements mm. because I feel that uh, I, uh, for once I can do more being here on the ground rather than uh, going abroad with, with the international mm. parliamentary missions in which I was uh, supposed to be engaged with. Uh, but other than that, I think that... Uh, the, the, the thing that uh, the way that I approach the situation at least is just to play it by ear and uh, see how, how it develops step by step. Have you packed a bag? No, <laughs> that's something that I didn't do uh, okay. again because right. uh, I don't see Let's how see, and where to retreat. Right. This is uh, okay, go on. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to finish the sentence because, I mean, uh, there's nowhere to retreat. I mean, this is my country and this is my hometown. 
and this is where I was born and this is where I want my children to grow up. So really, for me, the case is to stay put and uh, to do the best as I can and also my family can to make sure that Ukraine stays independent. And a few moments ago, Boris Johnson reacted to Vladimir Putin's decision to recognise the breakaway republics. He said it was yet another indication that things are moving in the wrong direction. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is with me. Well, it was quite telling that the Prime Minister could be quite so stark as he was, given that he started this uh, press conference when uh, President Putin had barely started speaking. And I think it tells you uh, the sort of briefings that uh, he's already had and the stern one that he listened to on his way into the room for a press conference was meant to be all about COVID. Here's what the Prime Minister said in answer to a question about President Putin's words. I, I gather just as I came into this press conference that Vladimir Putin has effectively announced that uh, Russia is uh, recognizing uh, the breakaway republics uh, of uh, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk. Uh, this is plainly in breach of international law. It's uh, a violation, a, a, a flagrant violation of the sovereignty and integrity of, the, uh, of, of Ukraine. Uh, it is a repudiation of the, uh, of the Minsk process and the Minsk agreements. And uh, I think it's a very ill omen and a very dark sign. We remember last week you were hearing from uh, the Prime Minister and other uh, voices in the government that they thought the conflict, in a sense, had already started. I think they feel that what they're listening to tonight from President Putin underlines that. Last week, in people around uh, the top of Whitehall were talking about how there was a more than 75 per cent chance of a full-scale uh, invasion by Russia of Ukraine. Uh, you suspect, listening to the Prime Minister's words there, uh, that percentage has only gone up. Thanks, Gary. Let's go back to Kiev and Matt. Yes, Chris. Well, just in the last few minutes, uh, more breaking news here. Uh, just now, President Putin has actually signed the decree, the presidential decree that grants or recognizes independence of those two eastern Ukrainian um, independent republics that uh, Boris Johnson was speaking about there uh, just now. This really does inflame the situation quite dramatically because it effectively buries the so-called Minsk agreements, the rather dormant agreements on which the hopes for some kind of peaceful settlement were based. They are now shredded. They are kaput. And, of course, the question, as ever, is does this now set the stage for something much more dramatic and military? Because, remember, not only are there 190,000 troops still based there, not only do we still have the Russian Navy in the Black Sea, but also just now President Putin said that he wants to protect 4 million people inside those two republics, many of whom are uh, pro-Russian, many of whom are ethnic Russians, but not all of them necessarily, 4 million people who he said were subject to genocide. Now, let me be absolutely clear. There is no evidence whatsoever of genocide in those two areas. There just isn't. So, of course, if you're looking at the, you know, if you're looking at the monopoly board, you've got the troops in place, you've got the, uh, the rhetoric in place, you've got the intelligence in place, and now you have, again, this pretext for what could be an invasion. I have to say, overall, the picture is pretty alarming.